Let me invite you to take your Bibles, open them into the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Daniel, chapter 9, as we continue in this message series out of this significant book of the Bible, we are in these latter chapters of the book of Daniel, chapters 7 through 12, which deal primarily with things to come. Daniel has been given visions of God and a word from God, revelation from God, to speak about the things that would come even unto the end of the age. And today we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 9 here in the Word of God. Now last week, if you were with us, we began looking at Daniel chapter 7. And in Daniel chapter 7, we are introduced there in Daniel's vision of what he sees. He sees the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father. He sees this beast. He sees this little horn. He sees this Antichrist that rises up. And he also sees one like the Son of Man who comes in before the Ancient of Days, and he is given all dominion, power, and glory. Well, last week, we significantly spent our time looking at the Antichrist, and if you were able to be with us last week, that was a message that went a little bit long. I noticed some of you brought some lunches today, and I appreciate that. Well, I'll just go ahead and tell you, as I, as I wrapped up that sermon and my son was giving me the lowdown after it was all over, he said, Dad, I took two and a half pages of notes. And I said, me too, son, me too. And in the middle of that, now I just want you to know that I, I asked Mark Myers for 40 minutes last week in the worship schedule. He gave me 35 and I took 45. That's how that worked out. But I'm glad that you're here. We're going to be in God's Word today. Thank you for being with us. And Today, we're going to be speaking about a wonderful subject matter. We're going to talk about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The reason last week uh, took a significant amount of time, and some people said, you know, hey, listen, it went a number of minutes here. What is that all about, Pastor? One of those things. Here's what I want to tell you. We could have divided that message into two, but you know, there's something about me. I don't want to end a message in the middle where it looks like Satan's doing pretty well. I want to be able to preach the true victory. I want to preach the end of the story. I want to talk about how Jesus is victorious. Amen? And so we want to be able to look at Jesus Christ today here in the Word of God. If you've got your Bibles open, Daniel chapter 9, and we will jump right in. Well, here's what's going on in this context. Now uh, we find that the Babylonian Empire has come to a conclusion Chronologically, uh, we find Darius is now on the throne, Darius of the Medes and the Persians, And Daniel is aware that the 70-year prophecy that the prophet Jeremiah had spoken about the exile of Israel was soon to come to a conclusion. He begins to consider that this time is coming to a close, and Daniel gets overwhelmed. He, He was broken for the reality of the sin of his people, the people of Israel, those that have been carried off into exile and he prays to the Lord. And he spends a significant amount of time in confession and pleading with the Lord here in chapter 9, and he's confessing sin and sorrow, and he's pleading to the Lord to act mercifully upon his people. And in chapter 9, God answers the prayer of Daniel in this way. God sends the angel Gabriel to bring an answer to Daniel's prayer. And God answers with a prophetic announcement to Daniel's vision. So we're going to pick up here in chapter 9, beginning in verse 20. The Bible says, While I was speaking and praying, 
confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before my Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. And while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, There shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and a moat, but in troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with the flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And here we come back to the Antichrist of last week. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Now the Hebrew that is contained in these verses is able to be taken in a couple of different ways, and we'll talk about that as we progress through these verses here today. But we have God sending Gabriel the angel to give a message to Daniel's prayer. He wants him to know, he wants him to understand. First of all, he wants him to know that he is greatly loved. And aren't you glad that you're loved by the Lord? He says you're greatly loved and God wants him to understand. And the way that God answers this prayer is is to, to give Daniel this prophetic understanding of the things to come. So the first thing we see is this. We see God's period of time decreed. God's period of time decreed. At the beginning of this verse, in verse 24, he says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. 70 weeks. Now, in the Hebrew, it's literally 70 sevens. And as we said last week, when we looked at that final seven of of God's calendar, that final seven when it's talked about as a week there. And at the end of chapter nine, when we talk about the Antichrist to come, that's actually a seven year period. And so there is this 70 sevens, which we understand to be these 70 sevens of years. This is God's predetermined timeline. God in this answer to this prayer gives a sovereign calendar. He gives Daniel a glimpse at the things to come where God would accomplish in his time and in his way to fulfill his redemptive work upon his people and upon the world. It's in these 70 weeks, this completion of time that God will deal with sin and evil and he will save the saints. This prophecy is speaking to what is to come for for Israel Did you notice there he says 70 weeks are decreed about your people? And so he's speaking specifically to the people of Israel and to Daniel in this matter. He says this is for the Jew. And then he also says, and your holy city. Of course, he's referencing Jerusalem. And so here is Daniel. He is still living in exile. He is no longer in Israel. He's no longer in Jerusalem all of this time, living his life in exile, and God has a word for Daniel, his people, and for the holy city of Jerusalem. And what God is doing is God is revealing to Daniel what is to come and why it is coming. He says there is this period, 70 
seven-year periods. Seventy seven-year periods. Say that five times fast. Now, last week, we talked about that final seven years. We talked about that tribulation that, that begins with the covenant that the Antichrist will make in deception with Israel, promising peace and only to be broken in that period of seven years, to be broken halfway. And then at the end of that seven years where the Lord will come. Now, here in this passage of Scripture, we see that uh, we want to deal with that first portion, not that last seven years, but we want to deal with those first 69 of the 70. So in this passage, we want to look today and understand that God has uh, decreed a time period. Now, a lot of people say, all right, pastor, how should we take these 70 weeks? I've heard people say that we take these things uh, a very literal basis, that these 77s of years will ultimately add up to 490 years uh, on a calendar? Or should we take it uh, the way that sometimes the Bible uses like the word seven or 70s and talks about it being just a perfectly complete or perfectly fulfilled period of time, taking that symbolically? Well, well, I certainly, if, if our interpretation is correct, I believe it is a literal period of years, specifically as we've seen that in conjunction with what we talked about last week. And so God has this period of time that he has decreed. And then also in this answer that God is given through Gabriel, we also see that God's purpose is decreed. God's purpose is decreed. He says here in verse 24, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. Now notice the purpose. To finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal both vision and profit and to anoint a most holy place. Now, that phrase there, most holy place, could also mean a most holy one in the, in the Hebrew. And you said, uh, Pastor, is it significant? Well, yes and no. Significant in this way. Some people will say it's significant in the fact that uh, it's going to point that to the end of time where uh, Jesus comes in and Jesus is, is going to rule and reign here from earth. And so it's the most holy place. Well, let me just go and tell you, the reason it's the most holy place is because there's a most holy one. And so really these things are, are, are connected together. But notice the purpose here, to finish the transgression. By the way, in this passage of scripture, we see these three significant uses of uh, distinctive uses for what we commonly just call sin in the English language. We have this word for transgression, which is an, a rebellion against authority. And listen, we have all been transgressors against God. At one point in our life or another, we have all rebelled against the authority of the Most High God, the God of heaven. Here in this passage of Scripture, it also says to put an end to sin, which is Sin is, is missing the mark. If you think about a bullseye on a target and, and we are to be able to, in the holiness of God, we are to be able to walk in such a way, but we miss that mark. We all fall short of the glory of God. He also says to be able to uh, finish the transgression, put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity. Iniquity is just that, that evil wickedness that we do against the holiness of God. His purpose continues to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place or holy one. And so God says, listen, I have, I have decreed a period of time. And he says, in this period of time that I've decreed, there is a purpose that I have decreed that goes along with this, that I'm going to finish the transgression, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit. That means bring all of this to a completion and to anoint a most holy place or most holy one. And here's the question, how is God going to do it? How is God going to bring all of that together as God is giving this message through Gabriel to Daniel. How is God going to bring all of these things together when these 70 weeks of years are completed? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because here we have talked about God's period of time that's decreed and God's purpose that's decreed, but notice God's person is decreed. In these verses, beautiful pictures of the prophecies of the Lord 
Jesus Christ. Here's the first thing you need to see. In God's time, the Messiah would come. Gabriel tells Daniel, he says, Daniel, I want you to understand that in the course of these 70 weeks of years, that in God's time, Messiah would come. When you see the word anointed one, you can write in your Bible, Messiah, Christ, or Jesus, and then the scripture comes alive. Here in this passage, he, he says in, in verse 25, now I want to read this in the, in the ESV, the English Standard Version, and, and then I want to comment on it. He says, know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and a moat, but in a troubled time. Now let me go ahead and say that I use the English Standard Version uh, from the pulpit because it, 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 it literally is a literal translation. This, this allows us to, to walk through this. Now, one of the things that I'll tell you here is, is that in the Hebrew language, I, I think that the English Standard Version's translation of this verse gets it wrong. I think the way that it's put together in English, it's wrong. As a matter of fact, all other modern English translations and even the King James will do it in this way. So look at this on the screen from the CSB. It says, no one understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed one, the ruler, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So here's, here's where all of these other translations, they'll say seven weeks and 62 weeks. What the English Standard Version did was it said 70 weeks and then 62 weeks later you have this take place. And here's the deal. Both of them grammatically are right in the Hebrew. You can make that happen. But contextually, when you look at that, that first seven of the 70 weeks of years, that first seven is in regard to the rebuilding of the temple that was destroyed by the Babylonian Empire. Then there was a period of 62 weeks. And so these 70 years are broken into 7, 62, and 7. So now we see that these first seven are related here by the issuing of this decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Until an anointed one, the ruler will be seven weeks here, 62 weeks. Now, this is interesting because this is one of the reasons that I lean into this being a, a literal counting of years. Because a decree does go out, and by the way, there were actually multiple decrees that went out fairly close together, but it was the issuing of decrees for the Jews to be able to return home and to rebuild. And that happens in history. And so for this period of time, this temple is rebuilt. This temple is rebuilt. Now from that point, there is another 62 weeks of years that takes place. In that 62 weeks of years, uh, the Bible says that an anointed one, the ruler, will come. Now, again, when you see this anointed one, you can write in your Bible, Jesus, Messiah, Christ, and it comes alive. Now, here's a beautiful thing. So when you put those years together from those decrees, it brings us to a time in the early first century to the timing of when Jesus Christ goes into his public ministry. So historically, all of these things come together. I'm not going to dig in the weeds tonight. I'm actually going to do that more on Wednesday night if you want to come. We'll save you a seat. But as we walk through this together, you're going to come through this period of time. That first seven, that first period is going to be in the rebuilding. That's a period of 49 years. Now we get into this latter part of these 62 weeks of years that come out. And all of those being brought together leads us into this period of Jesus' public ministry. Now, some scholars will look at the calendar and they'll try to work this out to be able to say this happens at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry and it, it happens uh, in history at the baptism of Jesus. And there is a manner in which that they draw that out and they make that timeline come together. Now, there are others that will take a different date of the decree, which is also appropriate. Again, there were multiple decrees that went out. But 
the other one will lead us up to the time, and this is more likely, and by the way, this is where I'm inclined to believe, and again, I hold it open-handedly, I hold this humbly and honestly, but as I look at this, more likely this is where the timing aligns with Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday of Holy Week. And when Jesus comes on that day, do you notice when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, he fulfills prophecy after prophecy after prophecy as the Messiah King that comes in. And so Daniel, <laughs> Daniel's thinking, man, Lord, I, I prayed just, God, can you just give me a simple yes or no, right? And, and, and Daniel's praying, and, and, and maybe he's thinking God's going to give him a simple answer, and Gabriel gives him this glimpse of the things to come, how, how marvelous it must have been, how intimidating that must have been. And even in all of this, you know, at the end of the book of Daniel, he's scratching his head, and he's like, I still don't get it all. And so in this passage of Scripture, there's just this wonderful beauty about the God who is in heaven. Listen, he does all things in his time. And his timing is always right and perfect. And the Bible says that in God's time, the Messiah would come. How else will God finish the transgression, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal both vision and prophet and anoint a most holy one. How is that possible? Well, God has a person. It's Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God, and he comes. Now, in addition to this, I want you to see this, that in God's time, the Messiah would be cut off. The Messiah would be cut off. Look at Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. Isn't it remarkable we already have in history that God has spoken that, that the Christ would come? That the Christ would come in history at God's appointed time? Now notice how specific it gets. It says not only that this Messiah would come, but that this Messiah would be cut off. Daniel 9, 26, and after the 62 weeks that followed that first seven, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with the flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. What a powerful verse this is. First of all, we see that, that this anointed one, the Messiah, the, the Christ, shall be cut off. This is the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Jesus Christ in sinless, blameless, perfect, holy in every way. Who walked down the Via Dolorosa, that road of suffering. And he walked that path not because of his guilt, but our guilt. Our sinful offenses against a holy God. Jesus took that trail with the cross upon his shoulders. And they took him outside the gates. And they crucified him at a place called the skull. It's a place of death. And there in public humiliation, he was pierced and placed on this Roman cross. And he was lifted into the air for all to be able to see. And it was there on that cross that Jesus died for your sins. It was there on the cross where Jesus paid the penalty. He took on the judgment that we deserved. You see, God was going to deal with the rebellion, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity. And Jesus, he goes to the cross. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 8, and this is a, a chapter that talks about the, the suffering servant, which has so many messianic themes in that. It, it says, for he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people, he was punished. That's Jesus. Jesus was cut off from the land of the living to deal with our sins, to carry our punishment. Jesus did all of that. And why did Jesus do all of that? Well, we've already seen because of what God has spoken through Gabriel, because you are greatly loved. You said, well, wait a minute, Pastor, did you not say that uh, this, is a, uh, this is a prophecy that speaks to Daniel and his people? 
Didn't you say this speaks for the Jewish people? Didn't you say that this speaks for the Jewish people? And, 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 and here's what I want you to, to know. Yes, it speaks to the Jewish people, but understand it's like a pebble in a pond. That what Jesus does on the cross is not just for the Jew, but it's also for the non-Jew. Not just for the Jew, but for the Gentile. That's why Paul is able to say in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also the Greek or also the Gentile. Listen, so friends, this good news in this passage of Scripture isn't just for the Jews. It's for all of humanity. Because Christ died for us all. In this verse, in verse 26, it says, After these 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince, look at that phrase, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, we know after Jesus' crucifixion, just a generation later, Jerusalem again has the temple destroyed, 70 A.D. And who were the people that destroyed it? The Romans. The the Romans come in. Just as even Jesus said in his ministry, Jesus said that none of these stones would remain on top of the other. And if you go there to Jerusalem today, right outside of that temple, you will be able to go over to the side of that wall and look where stones, large stones, have just been tumbled over, left for all of these centuries. It's just as Jesus said. Jesus comes into this world just as God has promised, and it was in God's time. Isn't that what Paul says in the book of Galatians when he says, in the fullness of time? That is, is when God's perfect time, God sent him into this, war, uh, into this world, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem us. And so Messiah comes, and then after the Messiah comes, he's cut off. And then after that, it says, the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that happened, folks, in history. We can go back and look with with just remarkable accuracy of the way that the, the prophecies of Daniel, the way that God has revealed that to him, has been fulfilled in history. In God's time, Messiah would come. And in God's time, Messiah would be cut off. But don't miss this. For all time, the Messiah will be king. Amen? For all time, this Messiah will be king. Now we look at this prophecy alongside chapter 7. You remember in chapter 7 last week we began to read and and we, we see in this final seven sevens. This final seven-year period, this 70th week that takes place at the end of the age. We see that the Antichrist rises up, empowered by Satan to do many deceptive things, leading many people astray, commanding that people not worship the true and living God, persecuting the saints. But there's something else in that vision in chapter 7, isn't there? Daniel says this in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Listen, if you fall in the category of all peoples, would you raise your hand? Listen, if you belong to any of all nations, would you raise your hand? Listen, this is good news for you. If you're in Christ, it says here that he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. That goes along with even the prophecy that was given in Daniel chapter 2. Well, what does heaven think about all of this? 
What does the heavenly host think about Gabriel's words? Well, John the Apostle gets a glimpse in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. The Bible says, And there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever. Friends, i got to be really honest with you. I know there are times that when you study prophecy, it's like trying to find a ball in tall weeds, isn't it? I mean, it's just one of those things you're just, you're digging, you're searching, you're trying. Here, here's what I want to tell you above all of these things. One of the things that has convinced me in this summer study together is how anyone could possibly walk through the things of this book and not believe that there is a God in heaven who controls this universe. He is over and above all things. And though the kingdoms of man may rise and rage and there may be wicked in this world, that this God has declared in his time and decreed in his time that he would send his person, and his name is Jesus, and he came, and he was cut off and crucified, and he was crucified for our salvation. And the Bible says when he comes again, he comes as a king. Wouldn't you want to be counted in that kingdom? Wouldn't you want to be counted in that kingdom that lasts forever and ever and ever and ever? If you're in this room today and you haven't settled that issue on the matter as if Jesus, the Lord and Savior of your life, I certainly encourage you to do so. And for all of the saints that are in here, may you be encouraged. There's times when the world looks dark. But we know who wins in the end. So church, be encouraged. And all God's people said, amen. Father, we thank you for this word today. Lord, may you allow it to speak into our heart. Let us welcome your word. Father, I pray that you will take the things that we have given attention to today. And recognize that you are in heaven, but you are over all things. That there is nothing that rises out of your control. But God, that you deal with things in your time and in your way. And God, I'm thankful that you deal with, with our rebellion. And I'm thankful that you deal with our sin. And I'm thankful, Lord, that you have atoned for our iniquity. And I'm thankful that you will bring all of these things to a completion in your perfect timing. For God, there is coming a day when we won't have to deal with this sin-stained world, for you will make all things new. And Father, I pray that everyone in this room will be counted in the kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.